Yeah. Welcome to the Hampton Beach Village District monthly meeting. It's July 8th, 2015. Can we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I just want to take a, a brief moment, uh, have a moment of silence. Um, Commissioner Buckley's brother and sister-in-law passed away this last weekend, and that is the reason she's not here. So we could take a moment of silence. Thank you. I'm going to welcome Betty Moore here from the Hampton Historical Society. There's a, a presentation on um, um, what, what the society does. And history. History. A little mini history lesson. Okay. Actually, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about Hampton history, yeah. and then I'll end with uh, um, what we do as um, at the society. Um, so when I was asked to speak, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the history of Hampton Beach. And... Um, being 377 years old, that covers a lot of ground. So I thought I would do it in, in a way by talking about an unknown person, a well-known person, and a Hampton Beach icon. And by covering those three topics, I'm going to try and get a lot in in a little bit of time. Um, the unknown person is Wallace Lovell who was one of the first developers at Hampton Beach. The well-known will be George Ashworth, who was a 20th century beach leader, but also, many people don't know, he was very active in Hampton Center politics and activities, too. And the third thing I'll talk about is the Marine Memorial, um, that beautiful statue that sits um, across from the Ashworth. Hampton was founded in 1638 by English settlers as a farming and fishing community, and it was one of the first four towns in New Hampshire, uh, as what we now know as New Hampshire. Portsmouth and Dover were settled as um, trade centers, and Hampton and Exeter were actually farmers, and people came to put down roots and to, and to um, have their families stay here. Today, when we look at Hampton Beach, we see a bustling tourist center, and uh, from the Hampton River Bridge up the coastline, it's lined with cottages and homes of all sizes and condos. But back in the late 1800s, the beach was only developed around Great Boar's Head, with hotels that went down about as far as today's Church Street. And um, here is the um, salt marshes, which is really what the early settlers used the, the marsh for was the abundance of free salt hay. And about the late 1800s, this was, would be what um, Great Boar's Head looked like, with a, a big hotel at the bottom and a couple at the summit. But this is what the main beach would have looked like. This um, was sand dunes and seagrass, and it would be much like... Okay. It would be much like the Plum Island Nature, Pre Nature Preserves um, looks like today. And um, with, when Wallace Lovell came to town, all that was about to change. He showed up on the scene in 1897. And because of his influence, within 10 years, the beach was fully developed as a recreation and tourist center because he was the person that brought the straight railway to Hampton. Back in 1889, in all of the United States, there were only 100 miles of street railway. In 1891, the Exeter Street Railway was chartered by the, legis the New Hampshire legislature to run from Exeter to Hampton Beach. And the charter was owned by uh, Colonel Stebbins Dumas, who owned the Boar's Head Hotel, and Otis Whittier of the Hotel Whittier, and four other men. 
and the charter, the charter, I'm sorry, would have allowed the line to run from Exeter to Hampton, down to Hampton Beach, and then up to the Northampton line. As I said, it, it uh, was established in 1891, but no one had ever done anything with the charter. But Wallace Lovell found out about this, so he came from West Newton, Massachusetts, and talked them into selling him the charter for $500. Now, he was followed by a string of failed enterprises, according to Randall. Whoops, let's see if I can get this. Ben, can you? Yeah, I'm working. Okay. He, he had a, a string of failed enterprises that followed him but he was a great talker, and when he got into a room, he could talk people into doing pretty much anything. And what he did was he borrowed, sounds like things that happen today, he borrowed money to create businesses that he hoped to later sell it at a profit um, for himself and his partners. So he ended up in Hampton, he talked the town of Hampton into giving him a um, um, exemption from taxes. He talked to the city of Exeter, and he and one month later, after he got the abatement of taxes, he began his rail line. And in this picture, you can see a very faintly a house in the background. This is at the it's starting at the beginning of um, today's Winnicunit Road and. Lafayette Road, where the um, Hampton Village apartments are. There was a Toppen house there. And from that area, it ended up being that the railroad was built in two ways. One down to Hampton Beach, and the other way went to Exeter. So as I mentioned, he started the, the first spike. Was, this is showing the first spike. And this is Judge Lamprey, who's 87 years old, and he was the one who um, actually hammered in the first spike of the railroad. He also organized the Rockingham Co Electric Company in 1897, which later became the Exeter and Hampton Electric Company. Because the railway was not authorized to sell electrical power to individuals or town government, um, so by forming this company, they could buy the power and resell it to others. Um, Exeter was one of the first customers, and they um, paid for 70 street lights. Uh, the casino bought electricity from them at the beach, um, and so that was um, some of the early uh, people that used their electricity. The, now, the driving of the first spike was really a historic event. The children were let out of school for the day, and everyone came from town to watch this um, happen. Now these rails that you can see, they were some of them were 60 feet long and weighed 1,200 pounds. In the best day, they were able to lay 4,800 feet of track. When the um, railway was finished from Hampton Center to the beach, the first day, 500 people made the trip by streetcar to the beach. Now the line to Exeter finished a week later, and on their first day, 4,000 people made that trip, a one-hour trip, 12 miles to Hampton Beach. In its first year of um, in, in being in business, over a half a million passengers rode the trolley. I mean, we look at a half a million today and think that's a lot of people, but just think of it back in the 1800s. And the trolley, even with all the expenses that they had, made a $5,000 profit. However, the bank should have watched Lovell a little more carefully because he controlled the trolley and he controlled the electric company. He could charge whatever rate he wanted for his uh, electricity. And it seemed that the Railroad Commission um, filed a complaint about this in 1897, and they disapproved of this kind of setup. But two years later, another company was set up, the Hampton and Amesbury Street Railway, and it, it extended into Massachusetts. 
so um, near the end, he had a railway that went from Amesbury through Hampton Falls all the way to Exeter. It went to the beach, it went down to the casino, and it went up to the Northampton line. Year two, he had $17,000 worth of profit. And at this point, um, that old saying, if you build it, they will come. Well, he built the casino, he built Canopy Lake Park, and a number of other recreational places because once he had the railway in place, he needed to have people moving on his trolley and going places and spending money. So he ended up buying this. This is a 1919 map, but he ended up buying the charter in Ma into Massachusetts in 1901. He also um, later ended up two more companies, the Rockingham County Light and Power and the Granite State Land Company. Now the Granite State Land Company was the one who built the Hampton River Bridge. And <clears throat> the thing I found interesting is when you go over the bridge from Hampton to Seabrook, it's all residential when you get over there. It's because he developed the land that way so there would be no competition on that side of the water with the casino. So even before he developed the land, he built the road to have the trolley to come up from Massachusetts. He was very, all was done, it was very calculating. Um, in 1901, work on the Hampton River Bridge started. And now this was a 5,000 foot bridge over a tidal river built on pilings. And it only took a year to complete. And when you think about it, it's absolutely amazing. So now if we look at this, it's 1901. In less than four years, he has under his control almost 60 miles of track, 50 cars, mail cars, snow plow, snow plow trolley cars, and car bar barns all over the area. And th this is one man um, coming in and doing all these different things. Here's a picture of the bridge. They talk about uh, being wooden and people would walk across the bridge. There was almost a fire every day on the bridge because people would smoke, throw their cigarette huh. down, and the bridge would catch on fire. <laughs> so there were always uh, fire calls to the bridge. That's what we call and, it. and here's a picture of the casino, and it shows all the sand dunes that were here, you know, that's now parking lot. And it, you know, now we have the seawall that keeps the ocean back. But this is really when I had talked about it being a, a barrier um, area. This was what it looked like before we, we got busy. He was also instrumental in building the Ocean House Hotel. And this was in 1901. And this was 50, this uh, building had 57 rooms, hot and cold running water. There was a bell in the room. If you needed something, you pressed it, and people came to see what you wanted. Um, this picture's a little bit later, but when it was first built, there was a walkway that actually connected the casino to the hotel. He also was involved in the um, Hampton Beach Improvement Corporation, uh, the leased land where they had um, leased the land from the town and then turned around and leased it to people to build houses. So he was quite active in what happened in, um, at Hampton Beach. But all this kind of fell apart with the invention of the automobile because the town still needed to get people that were coming into Hampton from t by train to the beach. So the town ended up buying the um, street railway service in order to keep their summer customers moving. But by 1926, they ended up going out of business because they couldn't compete with the automobile. Now, <clears throat> love, hmm? now we need one back. We do, we do. <laughs> um, in 1904, even as far back as that, it, the trolley started running into debt. The town needed it, the town ended up buying it, running it until 1926. But um, Wallace Lovell left the um, 
area in 1904 to pursue other financial schemes, which pretty much meant that he ended up kind of running out of money and energy here. He ended up dying at the age of 56, broken and in, broken in health and in spirit. The second person I'm going to talk about is George Ashworth. And as the trolley age came to a close, the casino was going strong, and the center of activity at the beach had moved from Great Boar's Head down to the casino. So the large hotels of Great Boar's Head were gone, and pretty much the Hampton Beach Improvement Company had leased all the lots and all these little cottages had been built up at Hampton Beach. And new business men and women were coming into town, and one of them was George Ashworth. And he came to town in 1898, and he started with the Avon Hotel. And here he is with his staff at the Avon. And this had started out first as a beach house, a beachfront boarding house near the corner of B Street. He was instrumental in the um, formation of the Hampton Beach Village District, which was um, their job was to help with fire protection, water supply, and maintenance of the sewers. He built a show place called the Ashworth Hotel, which we can still recognize the bones of it today when we look at it. It opened on Memorial Day in 1912, and between that time and 1921, it was rebuilt two more times because it burnt both in the fire of 1915 and in 1921. Each time he built it, the facade looking very much the same, but he kept building it further back, and he would add convention halls and more modern, um, more modern rooms. In, during World War II, he was part of the Hampton Committee of, on Safety, and he, was, um, he turned a couple of rooms in his hotel. They were called restrooms, and this was where uh, visiting military people could come and enjoy themselves and get off the beach and, and rest. It was kind of a private space for them. And he did a lot for um, World War I efforts, and he was recognized for his service. He also became um, a leader of the Beach Precinct and was a commissioner from 1916 to 1917 and 1925 to 1951 when he was voted an honorary commissioner for life. Um, he also was on the committee that built the new center school in 1921. He was a founder of the Chamber of Commerce. Before this, there had been a Board of Trade and um, he was elected their first president. And in his first year in office, they raised $10,000. And that, that's back in 1921. That's a lot of money to carry out a promotional program, which included lighting the Great White Way. And can you see these street lights that go across the street? He had 21,000 white lights going across the road as you went down uh, the boulevard. He was also founder of the Children's Day and supervisor of the playground. His friend John White had started the playground um, personally, and on his death, Ashworth took up the fundraising appeal, finished the playground, and um, de had it dedicated to his friend. He was also on the committee regarding the purchase of the trolley line that I mentioned before when the town had to take over the um, running it because he was wanted to make sure he could get the tourists from Hampton Center to the beach. Um, and it was really hard to run this trolley because in the summer it made a lot of money. But in the winter there was no one to ride it. You still had, ridership was down. You still had to keep all the trolley lines open. And we'd have these terrible snowstorms that would, you know, put them out of commission for days on end. He was also on the committee for shoreline erosion he was um, part of the Marsh, Recl Recl um, Marsh Recl Reclamation. Reclamation Committee, and he was um, very active in the 1933 when the town was giving uh, the land over to the state. He was very concerned about the um, seawalls and the jetty, and he worked for better police protection 
and cleanliness of the beaches. And here he is, I, the first picture started him as a younger man with his staff at the Avon Hotel. Here he is um, in his 80s with his staff from the Ashworth Hotel. In 1948, he was honored at Children's Day on his 80th birthday, and it was the event he had organized 30 years before. He died at age 87, and his legacy, Ashworth Hotel, still remains today. The last one I'm going to talk about is the New Hampshire Marine Memorial, which is dedicated to the men and women that were lost at sea. And this is a really a story of a lot of determination. William Downs lost his son, 1945, in the Pacific during World War II. And his son was also named William. And he asked the federal government to provide a cross and a gravesite and was told there was nothing available for those lost at sea. He spent five years in Washington uh, talking to legislators, trying to get something going regarding all the men and women that had died during the war, but it was to no avail. So in 1950, he talked to the governor, um, Sherman Adams of, of New Hampshire, and the legislature, and they created a New Hampshire Marine Memorial Commission that appointed Downs the chairman. Um, but it really didn't get a good start. It was having trouble with fundraising. They couldn't decide on a site. They reorganized, and in 1955, they really got the steam going to get this, um, this project underway. It ended up being that they um, selected a design by a well-known Concord artist by the name of Alice Cosgrove, who also did a lot for the New Hampshire State Planning and Development Commission. So her design ended up being taken and put made into a clay model. You can see this, and it was ended up New Hampshire granite was sent to Vermont, where um, artisans there carved her out of a 25 ton piece of granite. Uh, ended up being a seven ton statue when it got all done, 12 feet tall, and it's of a gold star mother laying a wreath on the sea. Here's another picture you can see. This is the plaster cast. We actually at the museum have the bust portion of this on display um, at our new location that's on Lafayette Road. It was dedicated in 1957 and there have been ceremonies there um, every year since. Um, this is a recent picture. You can see these beautiful gardens. And in this design, Alice had put the bench. People think the bench is an afterthought, but it really wasn't. This was all part of her plan. And there are about 258 names on the, on the outer ring here. And then as people are added, they're added on the inside of the park bench. And the statue reads, um, in memory of New Hampshire heroic war dead lost at sea in defense of our country. And around this um, picture is the inscription, breeze soft ye winds, ye waves in silence rest. And she describes this as a mother laying a wreath upon the water and asking the wind and waves to be gentle as a mother who covers her sleeping child at night would. So I hope as you go down Route 1 or do business in Hampton Center, you think of the contributions of Wallace Lovell, George Ashworth, Alice Cos Cosgrove, and William Downs. And now what I would like to do is invite all of you to attend our 90th birthday bash on July 18th, which will be held at the Tuck Museum. We have everyone from Goody Cole to the Vikings, we have civic organizations coming and doing things. We have the Hampton Arts Network will be there, the Hampton Garden Club, the Alumni Association, the, Mas the Masons will be catering um, food for us. And of course, with every event, we'll have birthday cake. Um, and after that, from five to seven, the Congregational Church will be having a lobster bake. And for $20 a ticket, 
You get lobster, corn, clam chowder, homemade desserts. And the money from this event, will uh, it's a fundraiser for the town clock in memory of Cliff Pratt, who was a former selectman and had been on the clock committee. So it, once again, that's July 18th from 1 to 5. Um, and if you are interested, you can find out on our website, HamptonHistoricalSociety.org. So thank you very much thank for having me. Does anybody have any questions? Betty, you mentioned a location on Lafayette Road. Yes. Your new office? Yes. It's, we haven't officially opened yet. We just got the sign. But what we did is we have a collection and research center off-site. It's about a minute away from the museum, and it's in um, that sh little shopping center next to Dunkin' Donuts. And um, so that's where we have a lot of our collection. And this gives us more room at our main um, facility for exhibits and volunteers and things like that. Okay. And mm -hmm. I can attest I gave a stack of uh, uh, history items from the Pelham. They took them, scanned them, and everything came back perfect. So it was great. So, uh, that's oh, we're, you know, and we really are, now that I'm here, um, I think the beach is underrepresented. And it's really because when you're open, you're busy and everybody's going full speed. And then when you're closed, people are gone. You know, it's, it's hard. But we really are trying to uh, make a big effort to get a lot of 20th century, and even now, I, you know, I'm pulling things in all the time, uh, trying to get things to represent the beach more. And as you said, um, Chuck gave us pictures and brochures. We were able to scan them and give them right back to him. We don't need to keep things. You know, with the digital age, we can we can have a copy of it, and that serves our purpose. So, thank you. I have one question about the Hampton Beach Village, uh, the Hampton Beach. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Hampton Beach Improvement Company. There was hotels, and there were things that were already here before they came. But I, I see no mention of did the people own the land, or did they lease from the town before the? Uh, well, it's. You know, it, that's a real hard question to know. I know that um, Wallace Lovell, when he wanted, was going to build the casino, he wanted to be up by Great Boar's Head, but there wasn't any land available, so I think that land was already owned by people, but it was that those sand dune kind of places that they ended up developing, and, and I'm sure down where the casino is now, that's what there was. When you talk about the lettered streets, that was all split up. But mm -hmm. The Pelham was there in 1890, so they didn't come along until 1897. Right. So I'm just wondering how... And I and I don't, I can't answer that question you know, I, either. I, I've looked, I haven't seen, have you ever seen anything wrong? No. I've never seen anything, I've read all the different books. It was a hundred year lease. Right, yeah. 99, it, it was, was like 99. 99 year lease, but and, what and about before after that? The, um, I think the town was like kicking themselves mm -hmm. afterwards. And because when they started to develop North Beach, land. they did that themselves. The yeah. town leased that land out as it as it went up, up because I think they felt once they learned they right, could be making the money, it, yeah. they were gonna they were gonna do it. But I'm sure the first time when people wanted sand dunes, they were thinking they were getting a bargain as they signed this lease. Except the last 10 years. No, no, were, yeah. Were a shelter for people who were underneath that lease. I'm yeah. sure it was tough. Yeah. Maybe I want to ask, I want to uh, just was add, the last year. add one thing to the legacy of um, George Ash Ashwood, so you can add this to your story. Um, he created a trust, and you mentioned that he started, he created that Children's Day, because mm -hmm. now it's a Children's Week. But he created a trust, and every year, the Hampton Beach Village District gets a check from that trust to be spent specifically on children's festivities, the Children's Week or the playground. And that's it. so that's part of his mm -hmm. legacy as well. Well, thank you. Yep. In your presentation, you spoke about the playground and that he had a fundraiser after his friend passed away. Then the playground was named after his friend. 
never heard of it named that. The white. It was the white. It was the white playground for a while, and it. It still mentions that too. I've and it, it 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 seems to like have moved like pictures it, it, over the years. It, it moved. All, it kind of keeps moving over the beach. Not anymore, but. No. It was not it in the It used to be down by C place. Street, right? Is that on the beach. On the beach yeah. at yeah. C Street. Currently, it's, um, they moved it, and they moved it on top of a parking lot. Because all you have to do is go down four feet, and a lot of people ask why, you know, a tar in there. Uh, it, it's, I, I put the, some of the toys in there. And you go down about two feet, and it's all asphalt. You go, what is this? The first time I did it. And then I dawned on me this whole thing was a parking lot. And when I looked at all some of the other pictures, there was a parking lot mm -hmm. where that playground was. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy, did you want to get up and. Uh, sorry. I was going to put you on, and then I didn't see you to ask you, so I figured I'll you know, put you I on right now. Never miss a chance to yeah. talk. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Silver, Blue Ocean Discovery Center. And first of all, I just have, I hope you, those of you, let me just put it this way, I hope you read Better Homes and Garden magazine because Hampton Beach was in this month's Better Homes and Garden and they specifically mentioned the Blue Ocean Discovery Center. If I remember right, I think it's like 10 places in the country to visit. Is that what it was? Yeah. And yes. Hampton Beach was number six. Yeah. And it specifically mentioned Blue Ocean Discovery Center. And I have no idea how they ever, did, we didn't like you ask them to do something this. right. I know. They called, they called Chamber and that was one of the things we mentioned. Thank you so much that's, because. That's, that's one of the things. It, but at the time when she called, uh, I think it was the agency on behalf of Better Homes and Gardens. She said they can like just so much in. Talk about parasailing, for yeah. example, the harbor. And I don't, I haven't seen the article yet. So, um, so we were very, very pleased to see that. Um, we've had a really good start to our season. We've had 3,500 visitors already. And it's only been just a couple weeks that we've been open, so we've, we're very pleased with that. Um, some more numbers. Yesterday I took two school groups, one from Dover and one from Winnicunnet. Um, little kids from Dover and entering freshmen at Winnicunnet. I took them out on a beach cleanup for just a little less than an hour, and we picked up 783 cigarette butts. Now, I'm going to have another group from Winnicunnet tomorrow, and I'm going to bring them into the playground. I think we're going to, I know you've mentioned other times that, you know, the playground is often overlooked. So we're going to clean the playground tomorrow. So next month I'll tell you how many cigarette butts we find in the playground. Um, we still need volunteers, particularly on Saturday and Sunday. Um, I am appealing to anybody who lives at the beach. Um, you can perhaps get to us easier than you know, where we other people. They say, oh, no, I don't want to drive down to the beach on the weekend. So consequently, we're stuck for volunteers on most of Saturday and Sunday afternoon. So if you know anybody or if you would like to volunteer for a few hours, we would very, very much appreciate the help. Also, uh, today, Wednesday, and tomorrow, Thursday. If you'd like to gamble, we would love to have you go to Ocean Gaming. Um, we participate in their charity um, sponsorship program, and we get 35% of their profits. So it's, it was yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Those are our summer dates. And um, so all you gamblers out there, <laughs> we would very much appreciate it if you could um, contribute. Um, August 8th, you'll be hearing is State Day at the beach. And in conjunction with the state of New Hampshire and the whole parks program, we'll be participating in programs that day. So be on the lookout for that. That's what's coming next month. As well as on August 11th, we'll be taking our yearly fundraising cruise on the Thomas Layton out of Portsmouth. <laughs> If you want to go on that, tickets are easily available online. It's a, really a very special cruise. 
We have many, many items for, um, uh, that go up for auction, and it's uh, it's our really it's our big, big fundraiser. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll go to old business, Bob. Do you have any old business? <coughs> I think the historic presentation tonight was pretty effective, old business. It <laughs> took us back to our uh, <laughs> our origination, and that was very nice to hear it. Um, old business. I don't know if movie night is considered old business or new business, because it was yesterday. Uh, <laughs> but we had a great crowd out there. John, how many people do you think were there? Oh, 250 people. I mean, so it, it, it draws a lot of people. People are really excited about it. And the best part about it is the price. It's free. And, um, and uh, I got to tell you, I talk to a lot of people every day in the hotel business. And they are, and they're coming from all over now. They're not just, it's not just the traditional Merrimack Valley, Worcester, Springfield. They're coming from everywhere. And I'm telling you right now, they cannot believe that they get free concerts every night. They cannot believe the playground they can go to. They cannot believe that they can go onto the beach and for free. I mean, I, guess, I, I don't really know. I've never gone to any other beaches, but I guess there's a lot of beaches in New Jersey and New York. You have to pay to go onto the beach. Uh, and the movie night and the sand sculpture. So we're doing a lot of work, with, and people are really talking about it and excited about it. It's a lot of good families coming. We have a few people that we don't really want here sometimes, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think we're moving in the right direction. So I, I think the movie night's great. This week here, I'd like to see us come up with something, though. Um, I just see how outside it's quiet now, and then it, it's, we get this craziness for the fourth that it kind of drops, and then we'll be busy again. So I'd like to, if anybody has any ideas for something to do, Next year, after the fourth, I think we maybe come up with some new, new, uh, new, new thing. Um, I remember that's um, old business that we had great success with the sand sculptures. We, we, we um, I just, I, I just think everything's moving in the right direction. So I think it's good. Have any new business? I would just <clears throat> use your segue to say we could use some more signage so people would understand all the things the district does do. Like right now we have a pretty good fireworks sign on the left side of the sh shell. It'd be nice to get a concert sign on the right side of the shell if we could and get recognition of the district in the sponsor sign, signs for the sand sculpture, if those things are doable. I think the right side is, is getting prepared for the children's <coughs> But that's but we've been doing the concerts for a month. It seems, uh, and, you know, it's just something to think about if you can. Sure. Yeah. So I think we're going to wait on approval of the minutes for last month until Maureen's here, because I didn't go over them with her. So we'll skip that. And now we have, so I'll back to old business again. I'm jumping around. Uh, the flagpole is deposited there. It's been ordered. It should be up, I think, in another week. So we have the new flagpole in the parking lot. The parking lot at the Clues property is moving forward. We have a lot of paperwork to be done, demolition permits to be done. Um, you'd think it would be easier being a municipality. I think it makes it harder. There's so many more steps we have to do. Uh, but we're in the process. It's happening. Uh, the parking lot was full with what we could do. Um, over the weekend, I don't. I want to get the building down to get a fence up, button it up, make it nice and clean, uh, and it's, it's we're, we're almost there, almost there. And everybody keeps asking me dates and times. If I could tell you dates and times, I would have said three weeks ago. Um, so so far, I've been wrong every time. So I'm not going to give anybody a date. <laughs> but we are working at it constantly. Um, I can show you my phone. I have all these calls from the lawyer, from the different people, and uh, we're getting there. So have patience with us. Uh, we got a great rate from um, Enterprise Bank. They're uh, a branch in Salem, and um, the rate after it's figured with because we're in a municipality is about 2.75 percent, um, and I've never heard of a rate that low. So I'm kind of excited about that. Um, 
So that we're, we're moving forward on that. It's approximately that. It hasn't been, hasn't, and we haven't closed yet on that. We have a bridge loan, and we'll be closing on that soon. So, uh, with that ending, I'm going to open up to public comment. Does anybody want to speak, Linda? Hi, Linda Gebhardt, uh, the Hampton Beach Fiddlers District Beautification Committee. <clears throat> I haven't been able to give any report the past two months because I was involved with the um, Hampton Garden Club event and uh, Hampton Arts Network Art and Bloom, but I'm here this month. <clears throat> We've been really busy. Um, thank you, Betty, for showing the, the memorial and the flowers. Uh, we planted every one of those and we weed and water. There's 10 people who do all that work, and that's a lot of work. <laughs> so we have a team who works up by, um, we call them the lady team, and um, they're out there watering. It's hard to get people to um, weed. A lot of people are afraid to pull weeds. So John and I kind of oversee all the weeding that is done. And then there's the um, Bridge Island team, and um, we work in the state park, and um, all together there's um, four boats full of flowers that we maintain. We might have another boat. We'll check that out tonight. So um, tourists really like the flowers. Um, they stop all the time and want to know what the yellow one is, what the orange one is. We had some Canadians on their hands and knees literally smelling the sweet alyssum and trying to communicate <laughs> the name the name of Sweet Alyssum, and um, it's so fragrant. So the visitors really do appreciate what we do. Uh, I know when I go to another um, community, first thing I notice is how well um, the flowers look, and to me that sends a clear message of the people who live there and they take pride um, in the area. Um, what else did I want to say? There was some damage. I think I reported that early this spring, but you would never know that all the damage that was done this winter has been taken care of and broken things have been fixed and um, things have been put back in the ground and, and um, Mother Nature has taken over and the flowers are magnificent. I have to say that. They are magnificent. Um, the, um, we have five of the, of the signs up, that, and there's one right around the corner in the little raised bed right here. I got permission from um, the new fire chief to put it in, and it's there. So um, five signs are up at all the different locations um, saying that the flowers were maintained and planted by the Hampton Beach Villas District. Got permission to put one in the state park. Do you want me to list where they are? There, there, there. Five locations. And um, the signs are up, and um, just denoting who, or what, and the tie-in. I mean, we, we, I couldn't help but think of the tie-in that we um, garden around the memorial, and how many people come, and so reverent to take pictures and to look at the name of, you know, and they really appreciate that that area is kept well and the flowers look nice and. And I'll say, you know, my husband's a, a vet. He was in the Air Force. He wasn't a, a sailor. wasn't in, you know, the, what they um, Marines or anything. But anyway, he was an Air Force guy. Um, so it's my way of giving tribute to the armed services and um, the man I love. But people really come faithfully there and they lay roses. And I'm getting emotional. But you hear stories, you know, of families, and that means so much to them. Um, I have to tell you that. I get very offended by people who put their cigarette butts out and climb on the lady. And so I don't hesitate to tell people that is inappropriate. Get off the statue. This isn't Disney. This is, for some people, would you do that at the Vietnam Memorial, for instance? For some people, this is the only thing they have that marks um, the body, the son, the daughter that never came home. So that's just really important for people to get that. So I'm really grateful that you told the history of that and how it came to be. Then we have a plaque in the, um, we call it the mile-long bridge um, garden. We're in front of the Ocean Walk, and it marks in bronze the mile-long bridge. And so we garden around that, and um, it's a historic site. And then we garden, of course, the garden in front of the Ashworth, and there's a 
a bronze plaque to the Grand Masons, to that family. So um, in our simple little way of plant, planting followers, we are honoring um, great people who lived at the beach and made a difference. So sorry about that. <laughs> Get carried away. Um, can I give a plug to the gallery? Is that all right? Of course. Okay. So in, um, a very kind businessman at the beach, um, Skip Windermill, has again allowed us to open up a um, art gallery, and I'll just kind of put that there. And it's in the um, Oceanside Mall. And um, so for the second summer, we we'll open to gallery, and our, our opening is tomorrow night, as fate would have it, and it's six to eight with food. And um, there's 16 local artists with local, there's paintings of Boar's Head and paintings of the harbor. So it's local artwork, and um, our hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 2 to 8, and Sunday, 10 to 6. And um, we are also um, have a, an additional space that Skip is letting us use, and we're going to be starting for the first time in my a knowledge that Hampton Beach is where you're actually going to have art classes. Um, I'm teaching a watercolor class, and there's going to be a jewelry class, and painting demonstrations. There's going to be um, an oil um, painting demonstration, and someone's going to do acrylics and watercolors. So I have a poster in the window of the front shop there. And I know people are on vacation, so there were one night, we're calling a mini art classes, because you can't have like a month long of um, expecting people, you know, they're here this week. So we're offering many different subjects and it's just a one night um, class. So if people are interested, it's posted on the shop window. So again, thanks to Skip Windermiller's very kind, generous author of allowing us to spend the day with you. Any questions? Good luck with the, with the open house tomorrow. Open house tomorrow. Y'all come. Anybody else? Hi, my name is Uda Pino, 21 Tardelanov, and I have a question, Chuck, if we in September could get an informal meeting together to look for volunteers and form committees for my Vietnam Wall for next year. How many people do you think we need? I want everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Uptown, underground, on the beach, over there. Over here, over I want them all. <laughs> Put me in, coach. Sounds good. Anyone else? <coughs> Dick Rennie at 29 Highland Ave. You know, we all know that parking is one of the biggest problems here on the beach. And I'm sure it's very frustrating to, for our visitors to drive down Ashworth Ave <laughs> on a Sunday and see a, a price of $40 for parking or $30. And it varies wherever you are. And I guess what I'm asking, Chuck, how does the precinct establish what our rate is going to be? I mean, do we look to what, as to what the market is or do we look at what the town charges? How do we establish our rate? We are looking to make money, but we're not looking to fleece people. So uh, you'll never see us at 30 and $40 a day. We definitely work what the market will bear. There's days that it's $5, there's days that it's $10, and weekends and holidays are $20. But we've decided that $20 is a fair price. If you're looking at what the town, what the state charges per hour, <coughs> You can park for twenty dollars for the whole day. That's pretty reasonable. Uh, Thirty and forty dollars, unfortunately, is a lot of money. But it's a free market. It's a free country, and that's private lots. I know we can't so, do anything about them. But are you saying that we have set a limit of twenty dollars? We have for now. Yeah, for now. For now, and uh, and we have overnight rates. <coughs> and, um, I know that. I that they've worked with people right, that are coming. This, the kids that are working at the restaurants that come every day and um, they have worked with them, parking them, maybe blocking them in because they're there all day so we're not losing a spot or putting them further down the royal lot and they're giving some, some type of uh, concessions to them um, because they're coming every day. And it's tough for a kid going into work at minimum wage or maybe eight, nine bucks an hour and have to work for the first two hours or three hours to pay for their parking. 
Um, it's tough for my volunteers. Yeah, it is. It's very tough. So if you're volunteering and you're not getting paid, it's, it's even very harder. Hard. Um, but we do have. We, we, we're in the business to, to make money in that lot, but we're not in the business to fleece people, and that's. And hopefully, and the town I think does the same thing. The town could get more money for their lot, and the, they, I don't think they go over twenty. Has anybody seen it over twenty? The town lot? I don't think so. We don't know. So hopefully it'll stay that way. Um, we, we have a parking problem. We really do. And um, that right now the Hampton Beach Commission is working on that, working on a traffic study, working on parking studies, and hopefully um, we can come up with a solution, some type of off off-site parking, something. But we can shuttle people in and out. Um, it costs money, so I don't know. I'd, I'd like to see all the people that work at the beach somehow get brought back and forth, and not have to and not have their car here. Because if, a, if, a, if someone that works at the beach is parked there for 12 hours, that means one or two tourists can't come for the day because they can't get a spot. And if you're driving around three, four times around the the, the, the donut, um, you're going to just Go over the bridge and go home, or you're gonna go north to to Old Orchard or something like that. And we want to get as many people here. I mean, it's great now that we've built these new buildings and we have all these new stores. But if there's if you if the the pie is getting smaller for all these businesses because you're not increasing the people for those stores, and the reason you can't get more people here is because there isn't any place for them to park. And um, so it's definitely a problem. It's an issue, and we need to we need to work on it. And, I think we are working on it. We're trying. With our new lot, that was our first little step. I mean, I know that's not the 5,000 spaces that we need, but it's it's a start. So hopefully, and, and I, I'd hate to see, you know, I, I think I, I heard the town isn't buying the uh, lot that's adjacent, the um, the hotel that was uh, the Westport. Did anybody hear anything? They were, they were looking to sell the town that that hotel and that would have added more space to the town's lot but I don't think they're, they're going to buy that so, uh, so that so that'll go into private hands and then that could be thirty forty dollars so or fifty or someday it might be a hundred who knows I mean it's crazy but if the market will bear it they're going to charge what they can so. is there any way somebody could speak with the state park by the bridge this week was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It was a mess at 10 o'clock. The traffic was backed up over the bridge. The traffic was backed up coming down to Ashworth Ave because they let in one lane of cars. I don't understand. At the first thing in the morning when they open up at 8, from 8 to 11, everybody goes in. You make people coming over the bridge, they go in. People coming from Ashworth Ave go in. Make two lanes going in. When you get down there, you have two people collecting money. One goes to the right-hand side and the other one goes over to the left-hand side. The traffic is a mess. And this is half of the problems just coming over the bridge. There was cars there. They were overheating. They were sitting in traffic. It, I mean, it doesn't... Three hours. You get another person in there for three hours. Especially on the the major holidays. And Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. That's when everybody goes in there. And then, well, this week we had 4th of July on top of it, so it was a little different. Yeah. But that, that's the same every Saturday and Sunday. I mean, it's crazy over there. I mean, Linda, you must see it. Oh, God. I mean, I'll, it I'll makes no I'll sense. S I'll talk to, uh, see, I'll talk to Mike. It makes no and, uh, sense. I mean, if, if you would be a business, you would get a guy in there for, for $10 an hour for three hours. I mean, you. Well, they have the staff that's doing other things. Yeah, move well, them over if you can. Move them over for three hours. Yeah. Saturday, Saturday night, Fourth of July, they call our office. They say they close at eight o'clock. Yep. That's and, that, and I've been discussing. I've had and more discussions about that. And they told everybody whoever is in there after eight o'clock will be told, and they did told. Probably. Wow. They shut down at eight o'clock. Right? Sure. Yeah, and I and I've talked to them about that. And that was something that, that, that was because well, that was because of overtime. Over so I got to talk to them. It is absolutely correct. Uh, I never leave the beach on Saturday. You know how you don't. Uh, I did have to go to the market basket to get something. Coming back, I'm going, oh my God, it's all backed up. And it's backed up all the way to the lights. And I'm like, oh shit. 
Because I had I had another NH1 waiting for an interview, and I said, geez, you're coming down from Portsmouth. I should be home by the time you're there. And I'm going to be late for this interview that um, actually you were part of. Um, and what happened was, cars all backed up, going over the bridge, they backed up, one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. I'm like, good God, I'm never going to get there. And the whole thing is going into the state park. Is that they've got one lady collecting now? It's fifteen dollars. Twenty is a five and a ticket. Go. They should have like two people going down that entire now road. That just while the in. cars are in line, yeah. you, you give, give him, give me the money, give him a ticket. Go. Keep going. Go. go. And There's they can go in. Woman. It wasn't like people looking for. Because money. once you get past the state park, you could they, boogie right along. It was down just down getting to the state park. All the way down so to. Uh, and then people on Ashworth and Ash try and go into the state park. Same thing. Coming from the bridge going in, they block on the traffic, so even if you wanted to get around them, you yeah. couldn't. And the 8 o'clock thing is because I think Doc alluded to it's, it's, it's four, overtime. Yeah, I was told it's because four people would get overtime from these two Unbelievable. And they got a call from the Concord headquarters and said, You shut down. They work four months out of yeah. the year. <laughs> That's I'm, on your, I'm on your side. That's <laughs> That's something they'll have their fall beach meeting up at the complex, and that's something we just need. We've to talked about. I've talked to my right. house next year. It's on a that. Monday, so you know the fourth is going to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday next year. It's going to be worse than this year. We've been at meetings like, where, where this has been brought up that they've got to keep it open later, and to get you know keep it open later, they did the opposite and went earlier. I mean, I've, we've been at those meetings. And why do you need four people to watch a lot if it's full? Um, they're open late tonight. There's a sign there, special fireworks, fireworks parking. Yes. Oh, they, 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 tonight you can park yes. here, but on 4th of July you couldn't? Yeah. I, I think they're trying to make a transition. <laughs> as long as we're addressing the state, I have a pet peeve. Oh, my God. Uh -oh. I'm not the state, I'm just saying, you know. The, no, no. <laughs> the bathrooms in back of the stage are closed. And I, why, I don't know. Uh, do you need, if the state can't get anybody, I'll get some volunteers. It's, it's essential. People who are uh, and over they 39 close at a, at, and they... At a certain hour? Or are they closed all the time? Uh, they close early, but I can't tell you what time that they yeah, close. I don't know their the reasons, but if it's personnel, maybe we can... Round up some volunteers uh, for, the, for Glenn's uh, entertainment, which, by the way, he's, he's doing an excellent job. And people come there for the entertainment, and uh, it's a hardship for <coughs> for senior citizens. They have diabetes; they have to uh, visit uh, often, and uh, it's not pleasant. The main bathrooms are closed at 11 o'clock, even before the July. This he actually early. A lot of We've been fighting that for, I, I realize that, believe for me, years, I but you know. We, we, we hear it all the time. It's a tough one. I'm good at cleaning the toilet, you know. <laughs> You're on it. You got it. You got the yeah. job. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, but do you charge overtime? <laughs> but no overtime. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? Thank you. Uh, Brian Lapham, 27, High Street. Uh, on behalf of Kim Baroni, um, Dave Gooch, and myself, I want to send a real big thank you to the Hampton Police Department. 98% uh, of the people we spoke to, and we spoke to hundreds, and I have also never seen so many people down there on the floor. I, I know it was mentioned in the paper, but it was crazy. Um, we did have a few incidents, uh, including some damage to the main sponsor, um, Castle, uh, which some clown jumped up on top, and then uh, luckily he hurt the back of it and took out part of the darks behind. Um, Dave and I got him, he was arrested, and 
probably didn't have a good rest of the 4th of July. But um, we filled out the police reports and we took care of all of that. But um, two big things that I got about the Hampton Police Department is comparing them to other cities and towns. First, they were nice. Secondly, they were extremely professional. But I, I really got to say I have to thank them because when we called you know, or they blew a siren, um, they were there. Um, when this gentleman went up and hurt the sculpture, um, Dave waltzed them right over and there were four officers right there where they cuffed him and took him away. So, again, I want to say thank you to all of them. Right, on that we'll go to anybody else? We'll go to uh, closing comments. Bob? <clears throat> I, could you take a second, Glenn, and explain the Seldane uh, Fiddler's Philharmonic uh, gig? That was fantastic. Uh, and to think, those, this is a group of high school kids. It's the middle of the summer, they're not in school, and they're still practicing and traveling the country. Uh, it was just an, an extraordinarily different sort of a presentation. Oh, please, yeah. Glenn, come right up to the speaker here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, You're speaking about the Celine, uh, Michigan Philharmonic, yeah. Celine Fiddler's Philharmonic. <coughs> they are 35. Uh, high school students, some had graduated this year, and they're, what they do each year is travel um, to various parts of the country. This year it was the uh, North Atlantic Seaboard, so they did two shows in Maine, one here on Hampton Beach, a couple of days off, and then on to um, the New Jersey shore and finished up in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, some very talented young uh, people. They, uh, we had them on Friday night. Fortunately, they were off on Saturday, so they came back and enjoyed the beach, such as it was. It was very cloudy and overcast. Uh, but they were here most of the day, um, and we had the uh, Continentals were on the night of the 4th and recognized them uh, in the audience. They stayed at the fireworks and uh, stayed and had dinner at the uh, uh, Cascade Cafe. So, anyway. What more can I say? We've, we've actually had some great shows this week, uh, starting with the Celine Fiddlers, maybe Continentals, um, All Summer Long, and... Uh, Elvis. Elvis last Oh, yeah, night. Ray of Elvis last yeah, night Ray was pretty Dan. popular. Yeah. 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 And tonight yeah. we have King's yeah. Row. Uh, they're out of uh, Providence, Rhode Island, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, actually. Um, good group of oldies. So. Yeah. What was the style of dancing that they did? It wasn't Irish step dancing. It was no. It, it it's, it's these similar. are these are fiddlers, and I right. think they probably had four or five cellos. Uh, um, unfortunately, <coughs> our commissioner Buckley, as you know well, uh, is a uh, consummate uh, cellist and uh, renowned in in, in, in her school years, and and uh, would have performed with them, but she was unfortunately not able to. Uh, not having her uh, proper instruments, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, it essentially, it's, it's it <laughs> they did not read music. That's right. Oh no! Oh no! No! no. no and and music. very lively group of kids oh, yeah. too. They were they were really yeah. pretty, uh, lots of fun. I was actually impressed with the fact that they actually got a standing ovation at the end mm -hmm. of the night. You don't often see that. You see it occasionally, but uh, that was. I mean, and that's the kind of thing where you might expect to see, that's all family and friends. These people are from Michigan. Their families are not here. You know. well, hopefully they'll come now that they'll tell them. Would you like us to play one more? Yeah! <laughs> is it true Commissioner Buckley is traveling with them? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I do believe that that, that might I be I there was a restraining order on Commissioner Buckley. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Well, so Brian stole a little of my thunder. I was going to comment that we had two new chiefs this year. We have a new chief of police and a new fire chief. And 
with the crowd that was here and all the activity that was here. Um, they did a phenomenal job. Granted, they've been here a long time, so they, they know the routine. But um, Chief it, Sawyer himself was out doing crossing duty yeah. on F Street. Yeah. July he was out, I saw Chief Sawyer at 1.40 yeah. on 4th of July night, so he was out there to commend make me. sure I it was going on. I saw him at 3.30, uh, 6.30, <laughs> 5.30 in the morning, getting all the speedos on Ashford's ass. Uh, He's been go. doing that every Thursday and Friday morning. I'm glad, I'm glad, I, don't <laughs> I'm glad I don't drive those days. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but they did a great job, and um, everything was organized. They, I, I saw we had... Um, an ambulance at the hotel the other day, and these guys, we were very fortunate that all the firemen that we have in town are trained as EMT. Um, so even if the ambulance doesn't get there, the firemen get there, and, and uh, we're very fortunate in this town, and I hope next year's budget, when the town gets together, we, uh, we make sure that they get what they need. And on that note, I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 6.37. Have a great time. Enjoy the fireworks tonight. And...